In this video, I'm taking my very first look at Prussia. I feel so stupid right now. What the heck was going on in uh, Dutchland at this point? Oh my gosh. I have never heard any of this in my life. So as I was coming up on the next video in the Napoleonic series, I noticed that it is on his battle with Prussia, or at least one of his battles with Prussia, because I'm not sure how many times he battled with Prussia, but I'm thinking probably a lot. But I feel like I'm not gonna do that video justice if I go into it not really knowing who or what Prussia is. Now I did read in the comments on some of my previous videos that you guys told me Prussia is kind of like the precursor to Germany, and that Poland was kind of squished in there together as well. Or it wasn't Poland yet, but it was going to become Poland. But anyway, I had heard heard of Prussia before going into this series, but I don't remember really studying about them in school. I mean, we had to have studied about them in school because I did take world history and they would have been included in that, I feel like. That's the running theme of this channel is that I don't really remember a lot <laughs> about what I studied in history in school. But whenever I had heard of Prussia before, I always thought it was like the precursor to Russia because it sounds like Russia you know, Prussia, Russia, but apparently that's not the case. So anyway, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this because I don't really know anything about Prussia, <laughs> but I did do a poll earlier today asking you guys which video I should watch on Prussia. I gave you guys a choice of five videos and the History Matters video on the rise of Prussia was the winner. So I apologize if you voted and your selection did not win the poll. I only have a limited amount of time. I could only watch one of these videos, so I'm just going on the sheer numbers, but this is going to be my first video from History Matters. I've had a lot of you guys recommend their channel to me in the past, so we're going to get into this right now. 1648 and the Thirty Years' War is over. This completely devastated the Holy Roman Empire, but a certain state, the electorate of Brandenburg, Prussia, ruled by a certain Frederick William since 1640, did gain some territory. So, a brief overview of Brandenburg, Prussia. It was ruled by the Royal House of Hohenzollern. It was mostly Protestant, it spoke German, and as the name suggests, it was divided into two territories. Brandenburg, whose capital was Berlin, was an electorate within the Holy Roman Empire. This meant that Frederick William, also known as the Great Elector, could cast a vote on who could become the next Holy okay. Roman Empire. <laughs> I'm already lost. This guy's going pretty fast here. Um, okay, Holy Roman War has just ended. In my previous video on Napoleon, they did mention the Holy Roman Empire, and I had to ask you guys what the heck that was. And again, I got a lot of responses like it's the precursor to Germany, basically. So I guess it would make sense that it's kind of connected to Prussia then. I also don't know anything about the Thirty Years' War. I don't know what that's about. Again, something I need to, to learn about. All right, you guys are gonna have to forgive me. I'm gonna have to go back. We're not too far into this yet. We're only like 30 seconds in, but I've got to go back and watch this again because my head's already spinning here. Wait a second, is this the guy that did that Japanese video I did about the uh, Meiji restoration? It looks like the same animation, so maybe this is my second video on this channel. Probably should go back and check that. 1648 and the Thirty Years War is over. This completely devastated the Holy Roman Empire, but a certain state, the electorate of Brandenburg, Prussia, ruled by a certain Frederick William since 1640, did gain some territory. So, a brief overview of Brandenburg, Prussia. It was ruled by the Royal House of Hohenzollern. It was mostly Protestant, it spoke German, and as the name suggests, it was divided into two territories. Sorry, I keep pausing it. I'm gonna try not to do that too much. Um, Brandenburg, is this, this, this is the same Brandenburg as the Brandenburg Concertos with uh, Bach? I'm assuming. I really would like to learn more about classical music and I might try to start doing those videos again, but uh, I don't think I can recall where Bach was from. Was he in, Was he from Germany? I guess that would make sense if they're talking about Brandenburg here and Bach did the Brandenburg Concertos. I guess Brandenburg is a city. Is that right? I feel so stupid right now. I don't even know what Brandenburg is and yet I love listening to the Brandenburg Concertos. Probably should have looked into that at some point, but you know. First time for everything, I guess. Brandenburg, who okay. so a brief overview of Brandenburg, Prussia. It was ruled okay. by the Royal House of Hohenzollern. It was mostly Protestant, it spoke German, and as the name suggests, it was divided into two territories. Brandenburg, whose capital was Berlin, was an electorate within the Holy Roman Empire. This meant that Frederick William, also known as the Great Elector, could cast a vote on who could become the next Holy Roman Emperor. This was important because it meant that he could elicit okay. bribes from candidates, and it also gave his territories there greater rights and prestige. The other half of his territory was called Ducal 
Prussia, whose capital was Königsberg, which was outside of the Holy Roman Empire, but was a vassal state of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, thus giving it the problem of having two different overlords who one day may want different things. Brandenburg had recently gained the territory of Eastern Pomerania, meaning that Brandenburg was connected to the Baltic Sea, which gave it ample new opportunities for trade. Frederick William felt that this access to the sea would be great for Brandenburg, and he sought to emulate the Dutch Republic and become a great and wealthy trading nation. They tried, but ultimately a maritime empire was not Brandenburg Prussia's destiny. The Great Elector also sought to strengthen Brandenburg Prussia's international position by introducing a standing army. This was a difficult process since he wanted it to be centrally funded and not paid for and thus beholden to any of his nobles. He achieved this after a few concessions to his nobles and by about 1655 he had a standing army of around 25,000 men. So Frederick William did not wish to remain a vassal for much longer. Two major events happened in the 1650s which helped with this. One, the Sardom of Russia invaded the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1654 and two, so did the Swedish because their king, Charles X, wanted some more land before the Russians took it all. The Great Elector, on behalf of his overlord, attempted to resist the Swedish invaders but was defeated. He retreated, regrouped his forces and, in an act of genius, submitted to Swedish overlordship in 1656. The Brandenburg Prussians then successfully fought alongside the Swedish until 1657. This was when John II, King of Poland and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, offered Prussia freedom from vassalage if it switched sides, which it did again. The Great Elector's forces helped the Polish-Lithuanians repulse the Swedish invasion and by 1660 the war was over and Prussia was a sovereign duchy. Brandenburg was still under the overlordship of the Holy Roman Empire though, but it was progress at least. The standing army that Frederick William had built continued- I thought that they said at the beginning the Holy Roman Empire had basically dissipated or something. Did I not hear that right? I'm confused. Why is he still talking about the Holy Roman Empire? I thought that they had lost the war or- Man, I uh, must have, I must have missed something at the beginning. Overlordship of the Holy Roman Empire though, but it was progress at least. The standing army that Frederick William had built continued to grow and by the 1670s it stood at almost 40,000 men. Brandenburg Prussia was still in financial trouble though, but Frederick William's efforts at encouraging seaborne trade made some headway. In 1682 he granted a charter to the Brandenburg African Company who set up trading posts and African holdings with which to sell slaves to North America. It was in 1688 that the great elector's successful reign came to an end due to a small case of death. He was succeeded by his son, Frederick, who much like his father had lofty ambitions. These were overridden by the need to defend that which his father had achieved since both Sweden and Poland-Lithuania wouldn't hesitate to undo any of it. He thus made an alliance with the Habsburgs in order to safeguard his realm against them, whilst also providing well-trained troops for the Nine Years' War against Francis Louis XIV. When Louis had his grandson crowned King of Spain in 1700, the Habsburgs knew that there would be war, which they would want Brandenburg Prussian troops for. But in return for his support, Frederick wanted only one thing. He wanted a crown. Frederick was going to crown himself irrespective of what anyone else wanted. However, since the Habsburgs now needed his professional soldiers, he could get some outside recognition. In 1701, he had himself crowned as the Prussian king, although be aware that he wasn't the king of Prussia, he was the king in Prussia. This was so that his lands in the Holy Roman Empire wouldn't have a king other than the King of the Romans which was one of the titles of the Holy Roman Emperor. It was also because this territory in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was also known as Prussia and they wanted to be sure that there wasn't any confusion. So, as the king in Prussia, Frederick, now Frederick I, gained a massive amount of prestige and his coronation marks the beginning of Prussia's rise. Not in geopolitical terms, that is, that was before this, but in historical terms, since the emphasis in Brandenburg Prussia was now on Prussia. Frederick's reign saw him create the Royal Academies of Arts and Sciences of Prussia and was fairly uneventful until his death in 1713. He was succeeded by his son, Frederick William I. This was because the previous one wasn't a king and so didn't get a number. The new king started out by joining the Great Northern War against Sweden from which they gained this territory. So Frederick William was an absolute monarch, at least ideally. He attempted to control the local nobility and centralise the state, but the nobles weren't too keen to go along with it. One of the most notable reforms that Frederick William brought in was the School's Edict of 1717, which expanded primary education throughout the realm. Well, most of it. In certain parts, the local nobility were unhappy and resisted implementing it, or more specifically, paying for it. The king also sought to speed up population growth since Prussia's population still hadn't recovered from the Thirty Years' War. He did this by once again emulating the Dutch and inviting many thousands of Protestants from across the Holy Roman Empire to settle in Prussia. Boy, you Dutch! You guys were uh, setting the example for Europe, it seems like, at this point. I don't know anything about your history, unfortunately, but it kind of makes me want to learn more about it. What the heck was going on in uh, Dutchland at this point? Also, I feel like this information is coming at me like a thousand miles an hour, but what I am getting is a pretty good general overview of kind of what happened and what's going on. It's not going to be the last time that I try and learn about Prussia, so I'm sure that over time I will learn all of this stuff, but man... I'm just kind of like, 
Oh my gosh. The population still hadn't recovered from the Thirty Years' War. He did this by once again emulating the Dutch and inviting many thousands of Protestants from across the Holy Roman Empire to settle in Prussia. Protestants at this time were, generally speaking, more literate and held specialist trades, meaning that they could provide an economic boost to Prussia. The reforms of Frederick William I weren't simply limited to things such as trade and education. There were also a great deal of reforms to the military, which stops being surprising when you learn that he's also known as the Soldier King. It was during his reign that the army grew considerably, necessitating necessitating an increase in the size of the Prussian bureaucracy. Army recruitment was streamlined and tactics were improved. Frederick William I also ranked serving soldiers above civilians and serving noblemen above their peers, which created a culture that valued the army and encouraged everyone to join. This is why by 1740 the Prussian army was 80,000 strong and pretty formidable. The size of the army is why Prussia has a reputation of being very martial and has famously been described as being an army with a state or being hatched from a cannonball. Frederick William I's reign came to an end in 1740 when he died and he was succeeded by his son, the most famous Prussian of all, Frederick II, better known as Frederick the Great. So Frederick had inherited a large, well-equipped and well-trained army, and since his father was a prudent man, he had lots of money too. Also, he succeeded the throne at a time when all of the major powers in Europe were either bankrupt at war or having internal issues which gave him freedom to manoeuvre. To manoeuvre straight into Habsburg Silesia, that is. He did this just after Emperor Charles VI died and was succeeded by his daughter, Maria Theresa. She would inevitably be dealing with all sorts of succession issues, and so, as far as Frederick was concerned, may as well grab a free Silesia. This started the First Silesian War, which saw a quick occupation of most of the province. The Austrians counterattacked the next year, but the Prussians, with their well-disciplined professional army, managed to defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Molwitz. This battle actually saw Frederick flee the field, but his field marshal, Count Kurt von Schweren, went on to defeat the Austrians, which taught him not to run away. At this point, all of Europe wanted in, and so, War of the Austrian Succession. However, in 1742, Prussia and Austria signed the Treaty of Berlin, which relinquished Austrian control of Silesia to the Prussians. This I have never heard any of this in my life. Or if I have, I've completely forgotten about it. I feel like we don't learn this stuff over here in the United States. This is too in the weeds of European history for us to learn. I feel like we learn the highlights of European history primarily, but we don't really get into all of this stuff over here. So this, I've never ever heard any of this before. It's just crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. Europe is just like constantly at war, conquering, bickering. I mean, don't take that comment the wrong way. I'm not being critical of Europe. I'm not being critical of you guys and your heritage over there. It's just in part like my heritage too. I just didn't realize just how much of this went on. It's crazy to me. I mean, frankly, I can understand why people wanted to leave and come over here. <laughs> Two, Prussia and Austria signed the Treaty of Berlin, which relinquished Austrian control of Silesia to the Prussians. This peace treaty would last for a whopping two years before again Frederick declared war on Austria just to make sure they couldn't take Silesia back. In 1745, the Austrians confirmed Prussia's ownership of Silesia, an extremely wealthy province, and hereafter Prussia can be considered a great power. So after Austria, Russia and France made an alliance in 1756, Prussia quickly made one with Britain. Frederick was convinced that Austria was going to try and retake Silesia, and so he made his move and invaded Austria. Wait, no he didn't, he invaded Saxony. He did this to take its army and money for himself, to lessen the burden of fighting Austria. This kick-started the Third Silesian War, which dragged everyone else's allies, including the already fighting Britain and France, into it, and suddenly, seven years war. At first, things went well for Prussia, but as the war okay. dragged on, things turned against Frederick and the Russians advanced, taking eastern Prussia. Fortunately for Frederick, the pro-Prussian Peter III succeeded to the Russian throne and thus called off the war and returned everything, which was nice of him. After France was defeated by Britain, Austria and Prussia made peace and agreed that no territories would change and that hundreds of thousands of people had died for nothing. With all of this in mind, it would be easy to see Frederick the Great's reign as being nothing but a series of wars, but he was a prudent monarch and a reformer too. He strengthened the economy by freeing up trade within his territories. He stored grain after good harvest so that when the bad harvest came, his people wouldn't starve. His realm also saw early industrialization, but a significant part of this was because he simply nicked Silesia. Prussia also played host to the Enlightenment and produced one of the most famous intellectuals of all time. Immanuel Kant, who argued that Frederick was the embodiment of enlightened absolutism and that he was so enlightened that unwavering obedience to him wasn't a burden but a privilege. Frederick's ambitions weren't limited to Silesia. He had designs on Polish Prussia since he wanted to connect his territories. The Prussians, Russians and Austrians conspired to place a candidate on the elected Polish-Lithuanian throne, which they did in 1772. One problem. The new ruler, Stanisław II, didn't go along with this and started to strengthen the Commonwealth. As such, the three powers opted for a different route. They openly and violently dismembered the Commonwealth. In 1772, the three powers reduced the size of Poland markedly in what is called the First Partition of Poland, because fun fact, there were more. 
The first partition saw Prussia gain this land, Polish Prussia, finally connecting the lands of Prussia with Brandenburg, and finally allowing Frederick to change his title from the King in Prussia to the King of Prussia since now he owned all of it. Frederick's reign would last until his death in 1786 and his legacy would be to bequeath a great power to his nephew and successor, Frederick William II, because apparently in Prussia there was some sort of a name shortage. Anyway, Frederick II left Prussia a much stronger kingdom than the one he had inherited. It was off these foundations that he and his forebears had built that Prussia would rise to eventually unify Germany. Prussia had risen from being both under the overlordship of Poland, Lithuania and the Holy Roman Empire to having ripped territory from both and establishing itself as a great power. Most of this can be attributed to the military and economic reforms of Frederick and his predecessors. If you had to pick a territory that could one day threaten Britain, France, Russia and Austria then Prussia likely would not have been your top choice. Yet through the reigns of four long-lived and visionary sovereigns Prussia would go on to do just that. And much of this success can be attributed to Prussia's professional standing army which gave it the capacity to punch well above its weight. Frederick's army was the envy of much of Europe but be aware it wasn't invincible as would be demonstrated in the coming wars with France. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching mm. and a special thanks to Thomas Gestrich and, and it is that coming war with France that we're going to get into next as a matter of fact I am going to watch that video right after we get done with this one. So yeah so I'm guessing that that red border was the Holy Roman Empire. I still don't understand that. You guys are going to have to explain that to me in the comments. I plan to do a video on the Holy Roman Empire in the not too distant future because I'm really kind of curious about that and what exactly it was. What was most interesting to me was seeing the makeup of Europe at this time. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like France and Britain, maybe Spain, but we didn't really see them on the map in this. We're really the only kind of established countries or areas that we still have in modern day. It looked like the rest of Europe was kind of up for grabs at that point. See, I had absolutely no idea that the modern Europe that we see is so recent. Now I know some countries were kind of added in recent decades. I don't know, I just thought that more of the countries that we see today were already in existence 200 years ago but clearly that's not the case it's just kind of crazy to me how much the world has changed in the last just 200 years i think we tend to kind of think of the world now that we live in as kind of static and that it's always going to be this way it's very likely that the world is going to look very different from the way it does now 100 years from now there will probably be some countries that exist now that may not exist in 100 years but anyway it looks like england and france were pretty well established countries for a long time and they still are which kind of bodes well for for them, you know, maybe they'll still be around a thousand years from now. I wish I could say that about the United States, but you know, the United States is still a very young country and I feel like we're still in the experimental phase. <laughs> So who knows what the heck's gonna happen over here. I just hope that if things fall apart, it's well after I'm gone. Anyway, I don't mean to end the video on such a glum note. I'm gonna go ahead and get into Napoleon now. Make sure to comment below and answer my questions if you can. I do read your comments and I always try to learn from you guys. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. I'm gonna try and have that next Napoleon video out for you guys tomorrow so you don't have to wait too long for it. So stay tuned for that and we will see you next time.